operators. Uh, we've got some operators that, that you'll know and some of them that you probably never have heard of. Prime Healthcare Services is our largest operator. They're the eighth largest hospital operator in the country and probably the most profitable. Vibra Healthcare is the, lar is the third largest operator of LTAC providers in the country. You all know who HealthSouth is. Uh, HealthSouth is one of our largest tenants. IASIS, CHS, all of these are names that you've seen and these are who represent about 65% of our total portfolio. When you're looking at, at our portfolio, we have very little lease renewals because we're a relatively new company. So we don't have any, any of that. We hold for the long term. We're not into buy and sell. When you look at our assets, as I said, we've had remarkable growth from zero assets to well over a billion assets today. Now you see the flat lines there in the latter years and we actually had it decline uh, slightly. We recognized that the recession was coming in 2008. Now I'll be honest with you, we didn't know it was going to be this bad. But we cut off our acquisitions pipeline in November of 2008. When you look at this graph, you'll see that that's exactly where, I, where we started. The graph starts with when Lehman Brothers died. And uh, that's, that's where the uh, white line, the red line is the S&P 500 and the green line is the REIT index. You see that uh, we've done fairly well. I was telling Justin uh, Reynolds Thompson and I were out in Las Vegas at a REIT conference in November of 08 when this bottom fell out. That was quite, quite, a, quite an interesting time period. But our, our stock has done very, very well during this economic crisis, and that's because in good times and bad times, you still need health care. We've had over a 35% total shareholder return to our investors over this time period. We have very little debt maturities that are coming up. Last March, we did a total recapitalization of our balance sheet. We have had uh, some quite unique times that, uh, that we've gone out into the market. In the REIT world, you go out on the market an awful lot. Uh, when uh, we did our offering in November, uh, when um, um, uh, the, not Lehman Brothers, but the other one that, that, uh, that uh, Bear Stearns, thank you. When uh, we got uh, my uh, CFO and I flew into Minneapolis and I looked at my Blackberry and it said that Bear Stearns had just sold for two dollars a share, I said that has got to be a typo. But that's the day, one day we started raising money. Uh, the day we got listed on the New York Stock Exchange, I called Melinda from San Francisco and I said, well Melinda, we're finished, it's done, it uh, will be listed tomorrow. We, we, the only thing that could hurt us now is if we had a, a worldwide terrorist attack. She called me at 4 o'clock in the morning. She said, well, have you seen the news? I said, yeah, I've got the TV on. We've already had four orders from London that's been, uh, been called. We had, that was the day of the London uh, train bombings. We have a tremendous amount of liquidity right now. We're sitting on about $500 million in liquidity. There's a great opportunity to go out and buy hospitals, and, and we'll do, you'll see a lot of that uh, from us in, in this coming year. Now let me take just a few minutes and walk through this very quickly here on the health care reform. I get asked this an awful lot, obviously, being in the hospitals, and this is not a political statement. I'll be glad to answer questions about the specific legislation if anybody has any. There are clearly things that need to be fixed. There are still things that clearly need to be fixed. There are things that need to be fixed that were passed that need to be fixed. Well, one of the things that continuously amazes me is how we as a country and we as a population just take what people say and assume that it's the absolute truth. And when you hear it from the media, that's the worst place to hear it from. We've all heard from, we talk about health care legislation and health care reform and the need for it, you all hear everybody talk about the WHO study. And where do countries rank in the WHO study? These are the countries that, that we all hear about all the time. And where do these countries rank? Who has the best health care system in the country? in the world, excuse me. If you all saw Michael Moore's movie, you all know that the best health care delivery system in, in the world is France, with Italy being number two, the United Kingdom being number 18, Canada being number 30, and we're way down to number 37. And everybody hears that, and they just say, my God, there's something wrong with our health care system. It needs fixing. But let's look at the WHO study and let's see what it really says. The WHO study characterizes countries in five categories. The first thing they do is the overall health level of the population. Second thing is the health distributions. That's inequalities within income levels within the system, within your system. The third thing is patient responsiveness. Are the patients happy with the system? The third thing is responsive distribution. Are the wealthy people as happy as the poor people and vice versa? And lastly, is it financially fair? Does everybody pay whatever is a fair amount? Well, let's 
look at those on a piecemeal. Health level. The first thing that they do is they look at the disability adjusted life expectancy. And the problem with looking at this just as that is that it takes in a lot of things that have absolutely nothing to do with the health care system. For instance, the homicide rate. For instance, lifestyle. For instance, your diet. And it also takes in automobile accidents. And I'll get into that more in just a moment. Health distribution. This has nothing to do with quality. For example, you can have a country who has good health care for the lower income people, great health care for the upper income people, and they rank much lower than a, than a country that has terrible health care for everybody. The third thing is responsiveness. This is the patient satisfaction, as you can imagine. This is the only thing in the health study, that, the WHO health study, that we actually rank number one in. Responsive distribution, again, this is along economic lines. And as I said, a country who is equally bad for everyone, even if it scores really bad, is better, it scores better than a country that has good, good responses for the poor, for the upper income, and, and okay for the, for the poor. The fit last thing is financial fairness. Now, a lot of people will, will argue this all, all day long, and, and, and you, can, you can go with this in a lot of different ways, but the who's belief is that if you make more money, you ought to pay more money. For instance, if a procedure costs uh, $10,000, and, and, and you make, or excuse me, a procedure costs $1,000, and someone making $10,000, that's 10% 10 of their income. Well, they think if you make $100,000, then you ought to pay $10,000 for that same procedure. Uh, there, there are people that, that believe that, and there's certainly people that don't. So where do we really rank? Are we, are we really 37? Well, let's, let's start with the life expectancy. They say that our life expectancy is 77.9 years, and that puts us at number 31. But you take out homicides and car accidents, just those two things, where we rank higher than some of everybody else in the Western world, and we're number one, by far. Let's take heart disease. It's the number one cause of death. Since 1950, Tonight to 2000, heart disease deaths in this country have dropped 50%. Cancer, the number two cause of death. We rank number one in every category against every other country. And you look at these numbers up here, some of the other countries that rank much higher than us in the WHO study are way lower. Which country are you going to when you get cancer? We're number one in the adjusted life expectancy. We're number one in the cancer survival rates. We're number one in death from heart diseases over the last 50 years. We're number one in patient responsiveness. We're number one when you look at what the realities of your true health care that you receive. All right, so let's look at the next thing. It's our health care system's out of control. You saw those graphs. It's cost way too much money, right? Well, the mortality rates declined from 1950 to 2009 by more than half. What's that worth? It's hard to put a dollar value on that. In 1989, Americans spent 5.1% of their total disposable income on health care. In 1999, it was 5.9%. In 2009, it was 5.9%. But the numbers you always get from the media it's not the percentage of your total income, but just the raw dollars. Of course the dollars have gone up, but so is everybody's income. So you look at the 5.9% and you go, well, that's still a lot of money. We're still spending a lot of money on health care, right? Well, maybe we are, but we spent 12.8% on food. We spent 17% on transportation, 34% on housing. We spent 5.6% on entertaining. That's going out at night. That's going on these ski trips. <laughs> We're not spending much more than that on health care. So what does all that say? Clearly there are things that need to be fixed. There are a lot of insurance reforms that need to be fixed. We need to open up the insurance, do, do away with the antitrust situation. But whatever happens with the health care legislation, the current health care legislation, from medical properties trust standpoint, regardless of what the fix is, you're still going to need health care in this country, and you're still going to have to pay for it. You guys are not going to accept less health care than I have, less health care than Melinda has. You guys are going to demand more health care, better health care. You're going to demand that when you get sick, when Melinda and I were your age and younger, when people got cancer, they died. That's not true anymore. Here in Birmingham with the UAB Cancer Center, we see that all the time. 
We, our rent that people pay us only represents 4% of the total expenses. So we're not a big ticket item when people look at how to save costs in, in, uh, in, in health care. And you're still going to have to have a way for delivering the health care. So with that, uh, I know we're, we're tight on time. Uh, I'll be glad to answer any questions that anybody has. Large the Alabama market. The Alabama market is is controlled primarily by not-for-profits, and it's a certificate of need state. Very hard place to do business with from a healthcare standpoint. The for-profits that are here are very large operators. We do business with those operators in other states. Haven't had the opportunity to do business with them here. Uh, we actually, this is public information, we, we actually four years ago made a run at Brookwood to actually buy the entire hospital from Tenet. I think today they wish they'd sold it to us for what we'd offered them uh, back then. But it, it's the not-for-profit sector moves very slowly. It, it's just a very long, they, they think in terms of, of hundred year increments. It, it's just awfully hard to do business with, with the not-for-profits from our standpoint when we can do it. We will ultimately get here. We've turned down some deals in Alabama. Uh, we've turned down some rural deals in Alabama, but uh, you'll notice we don't have a whole lot in the southeast. It's, it's kind of like that in all of the state over here. Yes, ma'am. You just touched on something that I was thinking about, that we've heard a lot about lately, the certificate of need process. And as you mentioned, not all states are subject to the certificate of need process. And can you just speak a little bit about maybe the pros and cons, your thoughts? On Is there anybody from the press here? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I think the certificate of need process is a horrible process. I think it's very bad for health care. I think it's very bad for the consumer. I think all states ought to do away with it. Uh, when you look at the dividing line, it's roughly all states east of the Mississippi have it, all states west of the Mississippi don't. That's, that's real rough, but that's generally what it is. I'm a big believer in, in, in competition in the free markets. If uh, I want to build a new hospital here in Birmingham, and I'm going to use my money to build this hospital, and I can provide a better hospital, a better mousetrap than what's here in Birmingham, 